Governor Ralph Torres' high-powered Washington attorney has invoked his client's immunity from testifying about the governor in the CNMI House corruption hearings against him. Francis Dela Cruz, the governor's longtime executive assistant, was commanded by subpoena to appear before the Legislative Investigative Tribunal Thursday, October 14 at 10.30 a.m. to answer questions related to her boss's activities as the governor. The tribunal, the House Judiciary and Governmental Operations Committee, has been entering evidence and inquiring of witnesses about the governor's spending, travel, and use of local and federal resources for private matters. The testimony thus far provided, including that of Lieutenant Governor Arnold Palacios, has been damning. Ross Garber, the governor's Washington lawyer, whom taxpayers are paying for Torres' defense, Monday wrote to JGO Committee Chairwoman Selena Roberto Babalta, invoking executive privilege and immunity from testifying. Mr. Garber's letter to the JGO chair reads, Dear Chairwoman Babalta, I, along with Gil Burnbridge, counsel of the office of the governor of the CNMI, represent the office of the governor in connection with the investigation of the governor and his administration currently being conducted by the House Standing Committee on Judiciary and Governmental Operations. Attorney Viola Alapuzzo represents Ms. Frances M. De La Cruz in her professional capacity as executive assistant to the governor. We are in receipt of the subpoena issued to Ms. De La Cruz in light of Ms. De La Cruz's testimonial immunity and for other reasons explained below, we respectfully object to the subpoena. Nevertheless, and without waiving any applicable privileges, immunities, or objections, we invite you to contact us so that we may discuss whether we might reach an acceptable accommodation. With respect to the testimonial immunity of certain executive branch officials, the CNMI Constitution mirrors the separation and balance powers embodied in the Constitution of the United States, just as the president is the head of the executive branch of the CNMI. The U.S. Department of Justice, under both Republican and Democratic presidents, has long explained the pursuant <clears throat> to the con Constitution's separation and balance of powers and principles. Senior aides to the president has complete immunity from congressional subpoenas. The CNMI Constitution reflects the same separation of power principles, thereby affording immunity to senior advisors to the governor from legislative subpoenas. Inasmuch as Ms. De La Cruz is clearly a senior advisor to the governor, she is afforded testimonial immunity. We therefore object to the subpoena on that basis. Notwithstanding Ms. De La Cruz's immunity, and without any waiver, it seems possible that we may reach an accommodation that will be acceptable to both the executive branch and the committee as an arm of the legislative branch. I invite you to contact me to discuss this. Sincerely, Ross Garber. Ms. Babalta is not pleased. Thursday evening, she issued a news release in which she defies Garber and Alipuzu's stance and threatens to hold Ms. De La Cruz in contempt of the legislature if she does not testify Thursday. Ms. Babalta's statement reads, as part of its ongoing investigation into the public expenditures of Governor Torres, the JGO committee timely issued a subpoena to Ms. Frances de la Cruz, the executive assistant to the governor, to testify. The investigatory committee gave six days notice, more than the normal five days for the testimony scheduled for October 14, 2021. In order to be as accommodating and reasonable as possible, the investigatory committee agreed to move the testimony to October 13 to fit the schedule of Ms. De La Cruz's counsel, Ms. Viola Alipuzu, who advised that she would be unavailable most of the week and next week. But the pattern of delay and procedural roadblocks at every turn has continued from the executive branch. On October 12, 2021, the outside counsel for the Office of the Governor, impeachment law specialist Ross Garber of the Garber Group LLC, wrote to the committee, Mr. Garber, who does not represent Mrs. De La Cruz, asserted that she, quote, is clearly a senior advisor to the governor, unquote, and that she is entitled to testimonial immunity. As authority for this proposition, he cites numerous U.S. federal executive branch memoranda, including from then Associate Attorney General Rudy Giuliani. 
He cites no case law, whether federal, CNMI, or otherwise. In fact, numerous jurisdictions, including the federal courts, have explicitly held that executive branch aides do not possess an absolute testimonial immunity. Garber asserts, without citation to authority, that the separation of powers doctrine in the NMI Constitution mirrors the federal Constitution and must therefore incorporate a complete testimonial immunity, as in federal law. No such absolute testimonial immunity for executive branch aides, in fact, exists in federal law. In Committee on Judiciary versus Mears, cited in Garber's memos, the District Court for the District of Columbia noted that, quote, the executive's current claim of absolute immunity from compelled congressional process for senior presidential aides is without any support in the case law. 558 Federal Supplement 2nd, 53rd, 56. Like governors, pro quote, presidents are not kings, unquote. State law is even less favorable to Garber's assertion of a sweeping testimonial immunity. In Office of Governor versus Select Committee of Inquiry, in which Garber himself represented then Connecticut Governor John Rowland, the Supreme Court of Connecticut held that the governor was not afforded an absolute testimonial privilege, much less his aides. 271 Connecticut 540. The JGO committee notes that the legislature's, quote, ability to obtain evidence from the governor is in furtherance of the critical constitutional check on executive authority necessary to preserve the Constitution's careful balance of powers, not in derogation of it, unquote. This investigatory committee has made every effort to be reasonable and accommodating. We are willing to meet with counsel for Ms. Dela Cruz and with counsel for the Office of the Governor to discuss any privileges or immunities she may be afforded by CNMI law, but we will not be distracted from doing the people's business by delay tactics or obstruction. Ms. Dela Cruz remains subject to subpoena for October 14, 2021 at 1030 a.m., which the House is prepared to enforce through legal remedies to include, but not be limited to, contempt proceedings. This is a developing story, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that will develop at the other side of this break when we will have live on our show via phone from Saipan Chairwoman, Congresswoman Sapina Selina, Selina Roberto Babalta, after these messages. We have uh, with us on the phone, Congresswoman Selena Roberto Babalta from Precinct 1 in Saipan, who is the chairwoman of the House Judiciary and Governmental Operations Committee, which has been leading the most dominant issue throughout the Marianas, and that is the investigation into allegations of corruption against Governor Ralph Torres. Congresswoman, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Troy. Uh, so first, uh, can we just have your reaction uh, after you saw the letter from the Garber Group? Sure. Um, I find it, um, you know, disheartening, and we're really disappointed to receive that letter from Mr. Ross Garber of the Garber Group LLC, who doesn't even represent Ms. Dela Cruz and has asserted privileges on behalf of the Office of the Governor. Um, so that is our response to that. Um, we take the position that his letter doesn't hold any water with the JGO committee as he is not the counsel for the next witness. Now, uh, Congresswoman, in the, in the impeachment proceedings against and the investigation against former Governor Bidigno Fitial, do you recall the legislature running into this sort of problem where uh, the legislature would call a member of the governor's uh, staff to testify about what was happening to provide to the legislature with information about what was happening during the time, you know, based on the allegations? Do you remember any sort of executive privilege being invoked? No, uh, not at all. So you would, the, the Fitial administration was, uh, uh, more or less cooperative in that respect? Um, they, from what I understand, the witnesses that have been served their subpoena during the FITIO um, impeachment did, in fact, appear before the investigative committee of the 17th, uh, 16th and 17th legislature. And, um, and then they, they asserted certain privileges there. But no, we have never had anything like this but this is um this is a, a precedent really for these types of proceedings and so there 
the citations that Mr. Garber is giving uh, harkens back to the Nixon White House uh, when the investigations against President Nixon were starting and then things went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and then the assertion of executive privilege became a thing. Uh, yeah. you, I mean, are, are we seeing parallels between the Nixon White House and the Taurus administration? <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, too young to remember the Nixon case, the Watergate uh, case, but I have heard of it. And certainly there are, are some legal parallels with that, um, you know, in, in so far as taking out, out a notch and taking it to the uh, uh, judicial level. Now, what happens, uh, Madam Chair, if uh, Ms. Dela Cruz does show up? Uh, because they're, they're, they're saying that, you know, you guys can come to middle ground. That's essentially what their, the letter from the Garber Group is saying. What happens if Ms. De La Cruz does show up, but uh, for, let's say, 90% or 70% of the questions that the committee asks of her, her attorneys tell her, you know, we invoke privilege uh, to not answer that question. What, what, what sort of recourse does the committee have? Um... We will cross that bridge when we get there. Um, at this point, I received uh, an email from Ms. De La Cruz's uh, counsel, attorney Viola Lapuzzo, that, um, you know, she has indicated that Ms. Francis De La Cruz will not be testifying um, until we iron out all these constitutional uh, citations and issues they've brought up and, and also that Mr. Ross Garber has brought up. So we are, you know, as always, we have repeatedly informed these people that they are not the subject of these investigations. And in response to this act of good faith that the JGO committee has informed them, um, we, we will be accommodating and, and be willing to meet with their counsel. And I've communicated this to attorney Viola Lapuz that we, you know, we reserve tomorrow morning at 1030 to meet with them so that we can iron out these issues, just as we have previously with attorney Anthony Uggen when he brought up uh, confidentiality issues. And we certainly have a procedure to address those issues. Um, we can exercise the right to go into executive sessions at any point during these hearings. So those are some of the legal remedies um, available to to the witness. But we have repeatedly, again, said that they are not the subject of these investigations. You guys have, uh, have been sort of, um, you've been circling or you've been getting closer to the governor which with each of these uh witnesses that you have brought uh before the committee and you seem to be getting much closer to the governor the subject of this thursday's um subpoena is francis de la cruz who is the governor's longtime executive assistant um congresswoman you can you be blunt with us do you believe do you believe that the committee already has uncovered uh illegal and criminal activity by the governor that's one part of the question and the second part of the question is do you believe that francis de la cruz has information uh uh that when pressed will reveal or will confirm uh, even more illegal activity by the governor um as far i'll answer the second question first uh as far as we, if we believe whether miss francis de la cruz has any information that will remains to be seen that is why we are trying to, or we have served her a subpoena to appear before the committee, um, and we are prepared for that. Um, as far as, uh, you know, finding anything with respect to the governor, um, we are not, I'm not at liberty to disclose that at this time. We are still making our case, um, and it would be premature to, you know, jump to any conclusions. Can the committee make uh, its case without Ms. Dela Cruz's testimony. Let's say it all goes south. Let's Most say definitely. let's say let's say everything stops here, and that from this point forward, the Garber Group and Viola Alapuzu and Gil Burnbridge 
stand in the way of every effort to get anybody else, right? that being Ms. De La Cruz, the governor, the first lady Will from testifying, Will Castro yeah. from testifying in the future. Do, are, it, will the committee be prepared to, to finish a report and present it to the House without testimonies from uh, other people? Most definitely. Okay. Um, we are confident of that. Um, but, you know, one thing I would like to say is that, you know, time and time again, the governor himself has stated that he has nothing to hide. Mm -hmm. You know, they have, they have not seriously attempted to discredit any of the facts before the committee. And by putting up every resistance at every turn of these proceedings, they've admitted, in effect, that he did commit these acts. There, I mean, there can be no other inference than that. Yes. You know, so so these attorneys um, propose novel remedies, you know, such as legislative censure and and everything else they can throw at us. And this, in my opinion, is a serious betrayal of the Constitution, the separation of powers, and the carefully balanced relationship of relationship of checks and balance between the legislative and the executive branches. We are simply doing the people's work, yes. you know, and for them to come up with all these, you know, um, uh, impediments to these investigations really speaks volumes of, of what is in their mind. How they feel about the people. I'm sorry? It's how they feel about the people of the CNMI. <laughs> um, that remains to be seen. We have yet to, you know, uh, witness any action from the governor other than, you know, throwing all these impediments our way. Mm -hmm. But the JGO committee, I want to assure the people that the JGO committee remains focused, razor focused in these investigations, and we will complete them. They just simply have taken it to the next level, and we may um, we may even utilize the judicial branch at this point. So, Madam Chair, uh, to be clear with the the people of the CNMI and also, uh, well, the people of Guam have taken great interest in your hearings, as a matter of fact. So, so the people of the Marianas, will there be a hearing on Thursday at ten thirty a.m.? Yes, we will proceed. I have issued the call last week. Okay. Um, Ms. Frances de la Cruz has been served her subpoena. Okay. And um, we do expect her to be there. Okay. What happens if she's not there? Then uh, the, the next procedure would be to take a vote. The committee will take a vote on, and, and proceed with um, criminal contempt proceeding. That's the next option available to the committee. Nice. Viba. Um, I think, you, did you want to ask about Will Castro? Oh, are we subpoenaing, are we going to subpoena Will Castro? The committee has not um, approved a subpoena for Mr. Will Castro at this time. Oh, because I, I have a bottle of Blue Label here in the office. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to ask. For the record, Madam Chair, among the, among the documents uh, entered into evidence by the committee, uh, uh, can I be? Can we clarify? Does that include a receipt that bears Mr. Castro's name for a bottle of Blue Label that the governor purchased with taxpayer funds? Yes, there in fact is more than one receipt. Oh, oh, we did not know oh, that. Oh, nice. <laughs> and then um, we have other documents that you know uh, relate to Mr. Will Castro. Okay. And this is the Will Castro of Guam, people. <laughs> that, is, that is correct. Is, we still haven't figured he, out how much he's making. He recently hired um, chief of staff to the governor. Recently hired chief of staff. Madam Chair, uh, has the has Attorney General Edward Menabusin, his office, any of his prosecutors or investigators or federal investigators contacted you about all of or any of this? No, not at this time. Um... We have met, uh, I, I will say that we, I have personally met with the Attorney General on a couple of other occasions, and we have spoken about these hearings, and we will cross that line if, if in fact, that 
um, they, we make a referral for um, contempt proceedings to, to go on. Understood. It would have to be the attorney general to prosecute. Understood. Is there anything else that you'd like to, to add or to say to our audience before you go? Um, no, other than the fact that, you know, we remind the people that the governor has repeatedly said, you know, uh, he has nothing to hide. Um, and, uh, and pursuant to the Garber letter that I received today, um, he, he cites a lot of case law, but uh, actually he cites no case law, whether federal or CDMI or otherwise, um, other than including the federal courts. Um, but he has, Mr. Garber has informed me that um, he's citing these uh, as part of the reason why um, Ms. De La Cruz um, cannot be compelled to testify and we take a different position from his letter. Got it. Thank you. This, is, uh, has, this has been Congresswoman Selena Roberto Babalza from Precinct 1 in Saipan, who is the chairwoman of the House Judiciary and Governmental Operations Committee, uh, which has been leading the dominant issue here in the Mariana Islands, the investigation into allegations of corruption against uh, CNMI Governor Rob Torres. Thank you so much, Congresswoman, for joining us today, and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, and be safe. You too, you too. Congresswoman. You too. Please be safe. Uh, so that is all we have for you tonight, our breaking news for the evening. Thank you uh, for joining us for Candid News. I'm Troy Torres. And I'm Johnny Rosario. Good night.